A social contract theory is um, probably one of the first real attempts at trying to give an account of morality that doesn't really depend upon um, you know some external condition like culture or uh, you know just what people believe or what people say. Now it's a little bit of a sticky road but in, in the end uh, th there's at least going to be a claim that this is going to appeal to some kind of uh, independent standard regardless of what people think or believe. Right. What's interesting about social contract theory is that the theory does already start out with the idea that you have to consider what other people are going to do. You have to consider other people's interests. The other ones so far really haven't done that. You know, um, Cultural relativism didn't really care so much about what other people did. It's just, uh, uh, this is, you know, cultural relativism says this is what the culture says it is, so we're going to do this. Um, same thing with uh, subjectivism. Subjectivism kind of sort of ignored everybody else, right? Same thing with egoism. Egoism, uh, at least on its surface, uh, is dealing, you know, just with number one. Uh, social contract theory starts out with the presumption that you're going to have to consider other people. And what are you going to do uh, in light of that situation? So, uh, the chapter starts out with this talk about the state of nature. Um, it's a hypothetical scenario. Hobbes is not trying to say social contract theory is true because the state of nature happened. That's not what's going on. He's trying to he's trying to imagine a scenario. You know what what will happen uh, if we try to make our decisions, what's in our best interest, um, but not considering anybody else. Same thing with the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma. Uh, is looking at what choices and what are the consequences of those choices, what's going to happen if you're looking out for your own interests but you're not considering anybody else. At the heart of social contract theory is the idea that what fully rational people would decide to do and what they would agree to do uh, when, they're, when they're considering what, uh, their interests and, their, and everybody else's interests, uh, what they would agree to do is what is moral. So, you know, j just the you know, just this definition of uh, social contract theory. I'm not going to say it verbatim off the top of my head. It, well, it's in the it's in the chapters in italics, so you, you could read it. But the idea is is that this is what fully rational people would decide to do and agree upon uh, when they're considering their interests, and especially when they're considering the interests of everybody else. Now that would be an uncomfortable fall. It's kind of dangerous out here. Got some steep edges, rough terrain, a little bit rocky ground, sometimes not that solid a foundation. Not really many people around here. If I were to get hurt, I'd be on my own. I've only got some water with me. Don't really have any food. Well, this is kind of the situation that Hobbes is talking about when he talks about the state of nature. He's not talking about trees, he's not talking about wild animals. What he's trying to describe is a situation that we're in when we are separated from each other or we're not relying on each other. Right? So, really big thing is uh, there's not a whole lot of resources. Right? I've just got some water. Um, another thing is that, that there's no real clear uh, strongest power here. You know, even if I came across uh, somebody who was a lot stronger than me, uh, that person, you know, that, that guy might be stronger than any individual, but he or she wouldn't be stronger than a group of us. Um, you know, nobody's really gonna help <laughs> in this situation. Um, there's, uh, you know, there's just not a whole lot of uh, people willing to, to, you know, kind of help somebody out here. So this, this idea behind the state of nature is that you're on your own. You're on your own. Now Hobbes, I don't know, he might have, he might, it, it, it's an interesting question in the history whether we were ever in the state of nature. But that's not the point 
of thinking of the state or nature. The point of the state or nature is to think of what it would mean for us just to completely work independently of each other. To not worry about how our actions affect anybody else. You know, even more importantly, not worry about how uh, our act, you know, somebody else's actions affect us, right? Um, and, you know, to, to kind of think that uh, it doesn't matter what I do uh, so long as I'm, you know, just looking out for myself. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how my actions affect anybody else. And that's the idea behind the state of nature. I'm going to avoid that. Might be the state of nature, but it's not all bad. So imagine the following scenario. Imagine that you're traveling, say, you're vacationing in a country that's not too well known for the protection of uh, human rights. <laughs> Let's just phrase it that way. Um, and suppose uh, during your vacation you have been picked up by the police. You and actually a random stranger on the street were picked up by the police. When you're brought into the interrogation room, you're told that uh, you and this stranger, whom you have no contact with, complete, you know, you aren't able to talk with this stranger, you don't know who this person is, uh, that you and this stranger are going to be charged with robbing a bank. And you will be found guilty whether you did it or not. They just don't care. All they're concerned about is uh, charging you with a crime and finding somebody guilty of the crime. But they give you an option. They say, look, we'll give you the opportunity to confess to robbing the bank and also uh, to implicate, you know, to accuse the, uh, the, you know, the other guy that we picked up. So the idea is you say you robbed the bank, that both of you robbed the bank. Right? And you confess to it and you accuse the other guy. And here's the deal. If you confess and accuse the other guy, and if he doesn't confess, if he keeps silent, then he goes to jail for 10 years and you go free. On the other hand, if you keep silent and he confesses and accuses you, then you go to jail for 10 years and he goes free. Now, if both of you confess and accuse the other, you're both obviously guilty, so we'll send you to jail for five years. Um, but if you both keep silent, that's annoying. We're still going to convict you. We're still going to find you guilty. But we'll send you each to jail for one year. When I look at this situation, right? suppose uh, the other guy remains silent. If he remains silent, and you also remain silent, then you go to jail for one year. One year. But if he remains silent and you confess, then you go free. You get to go home. Okay. Well, suppose that he decides to confess and also accuse you. Well, if, if he confesses and you remain silent, then you go to jail for 10 years. Now, if he confesses and you confess, then you go to jail for only five years. So what this means is, you know, in the, in the first case, if he remains silent, um, and you remain silent, then you go to jail for one year. But if you confess, you go free. So that means, in the first case, if he remains silent, if you confess, then you uh, spend less time in jail. Specifically, no time. In the second case, if he confesses, and you remain silent, then you go to jail for ten years. But if he confesses, and you confess, uh, then you only go to jail for five years. So you spend less time if you confess. Well, in other words, what that means is that no matter what this other, what the stranger does, you spend less time in jail by confessing. 
So it seems like the rational thing to do in this situation is to confess, is to accuse the other and go to jail. Oh, you know, and send him to jail, I should say. But, but now, look what happens. If both of you do the rational thing, you both spend five years in jail. I mean, he's thinking the same way you are, right? He's, put, he's done the math, too. He realizes that if he doesn't confess, he goes to jail for a longer amount of time. But if he confesses, then he goes to jail for a lesser amount of time. So if both of you do the rational thing, you spend five years in jail. But, you know, if you're just thinking of yourself, you both go to five years in jail. But, if you think about what the other person is going to do, and what's better for the both of you, then you both remain silent, and you go to jail for only one year. So this raises an interesting problem. No matter what the other guy does, if you confess, you spend less time in jail. But if both of you do the rational thing, uh, you spend less time in jail. So this raises an interesting problem. How are you supposed to uh, make a decision here? Do you make a decision based upon your own best interests and go to jail for five years? Or both of you, I should say. Do both of you make a decision based upon each individual's best interest and go to jail for five years? Or do both of you make a decision best up based upon what's best for everybody and only go to jail for one year? Hmm. Well, imagine the scenario is a little bit different. Imagine this. You're driving in San Antonio traffic. You're in a hurry and so is everyone else. Now you're trying to enter into the lane to get onto the highway. Now, if people are entering the lane, they're going on one by one. And you see a space up ahead. So, if you were to speed up and kind of get into that space, then you'd be late. I mean, so you'd, you'd be on time. But, you know, especially if enough of you are doing it, you make everybody else late. Right? There's lots of people who are trying to speed up ahead to get into that spot. Everybody behind would be late. Let's say, you know, you'll, be, you'll get to your uh, place on time and everybody else would be at least 30 minutes late. All right. Now suppose that you're already in the lane, or you, know, you have the choice to either enter the lane or to speed up. And suppose that you decide to uh, enter the lane as you turn, right? There's a whole line of cars in front of you entering onto the highway, which you've gotten into line, and a whole lot of people have gone up, have sped up ahead and taken up those spaces. In which case, now you're 30 minutes, at least 30 minutes late, and they're going to get to their job on time. Um, now, you could all try to speed up ahead. If you all try to speed up ahead, you know, there'll be a jam in the road, and you kind of squeeze in there. Uh, it would cause a problem, but you know, you'd probably just be 20 minutes late. 20 minutes late. On the other hand, if everybody takes their time, enters into the lane when, uh, when the opportunity first you know, provides itself, you're just getting in line to get onto the highway, you enter into the lane, all of you will be only like five minutes late. So you have a choice. Okay. Now suppose everybody just enters into the lane. You could enter into the lane too and you'd be five minutes late for work. Um, or you could speed up ahead and get to either work or class <laughs> on time. So what that looks like is if everybody else is entering the lane, 
You spend less time in traffic if you speed up on ahead. Well, uh, suppose everybody else speeds up on ahead. And you can either enter the lane or you can speed up with them. Well, if you enter the lane, then you're 30 minutes late. If you speed up with them, then you're 20 minutes late. So it looks like if they're speeding up on ahead, you'll spend less time in traffic if you speed, if you speed up ahead. So what this means is, uh, if you're looking out for just yourself, then, uh, then you're gonna spend uh, uh, less time in traffic if you speed up on ahead, no matter what everybody else is doing, you're going to spend less time in traffic. That means that you're looking out for yourself. Now, other drivers on the road are thinking the same thing. So that means that all the drivers, uh, that you're, you, know, you want to speed up on ahead because you'll spend less time in traffic, they're thinking the same thing. They're going to speed up on ahead. But it, it looks like everybody's going to win up at least 20 minutes in traffic trying to get onto the highway. However... If everybody just enters the lane at their turn, if everybody considers everybody else's interests as well, everybody spends less time overall in traffic. You may never be captured <laughs> in a country, but the reasoning behind the prisoner's dilemma applies to your everyday life. You can either choose to look out only for your own interests or you can choose to look out for everybody's. And looking out for yourself, if everybody makes the same choice, everybody suffers a lot. If everybody cooperates, if everybody makes the same choice to look out for everybody else, everybody's better off. So we talked about the state of nature, and we talked about the prisoner's dilemma. So how are they supposed to be related? Well, Hobbes wasn't necessarily thinking of the prisoner's dilemma, at least not explicitly, when he talked about the state of nature. But the state of nature is, the, you know, this situation where we uh, are not relying on each other. Right? We haven't made any agreements on how to behave with regard to each other. And that's kind of like the situation you're in. If you're, uh, you know, you're captured by these, you know, this, this government and made a prisoner, you have no contact with the stranger, with the other person who could either accuse you or not accuse you. Um, now, you know, in that situation, it seems perfectly rational to uh, confess, to accuse each other, to turn on each other, to look out only for one's own interests. Yeah, but as we saw, if everybody's rational in that way, if everybody only looks out for themselves, everybody suffers. Right? So, um, what Hobbes uh, suggests then is that we um, that you know we can remove ourselves from that situation and we ag make agreements with each other. Right? And the agreement, you know, so imagine the situation where you and the prison, where you and the stranger have a moment to talk and say, "Look, how about you know we both just remain silent? Then we'll then we'll only." Um, serve a year in jail. Right? So, this is, uh, so this is supposed to be a solution to the state of nature. That we come together and we make agreements on how we should look out for each other and therefore we're, we're better off than the situation where, where we're just, you know, <laughs> looking out only for ourselves. Where we're, you know, maybe even stepping on each other a little bit to reach the top. And, um, you know, the prisoner's dilemma, it applies to your everyday life. You do make choices uh, regarding the prisoner's dilemma. So here's, so here's where Hobbes suggests this, uh, this idea of the social contract theory. And this is supposed to account for what is moral. What is moral is what rational people would decide to do or decide to agree to in order to look out for everybody's interests. So rational people, what rational people would decide to do in order to look to, you know, so, for, so everybody benefits, so everybody is better off. So this is an interesting claim. It's not, 
they don't, you know, social contract theory doesn't want to drift over to cultural relativism, although it's starting to kind of sound like it. But the difference is, is that your know, cultural relativism says that what is moral just is what the culture says. Uh, the difference here that social contract theorists are trying to push upon is uh, what is moral is what fully rational people would agree upon. And there's the idea is that there's going to be a fact of the matter of what fully rational people agree upon because what is rational is not something that's relative. What is rational is something that's absolute. So that, that's the main motivation and the main idea behind social contract theory. It's what rational people would decide to do, decide to agree upon, in order to, uh, in order to, uh, in order that everybody would uh, benefit more.